Let China sleep, for when she wakes, she will shake the world. This alleged prophecy, attributed to the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, is seemingly coming true. It is the 21st century, and no region of the world has escaped China's economic and political vision. At a time when America is increasingly inward-looking and less interested in the rest of the world, many are wondering, is China about to take the lead globally? Many regimes across the Middle East and North Africa are looking towards Beijing for their political future. As one UAE-based academic told the UK's Financial Times, the trend is more China, less America on all fronts. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has been on an Asia trip all week. It's seen as a diplomatic pivot. A comprehensive strategic partnership. The deal signed between China and Iran is expected to boost their long-standing economic and political alliance. But what does more China and less America mean for the governments and the people of Southwest Asia? <laughs> What are the trade-offs for a growing partnership with Beijing? I was praying, I was crying, and I don't know what I have to do. And my son was crying. He said, where is my daddy? Why he is not coming? Cooperation, conflict, trade, diplomacy and encounters between China and the Middle East have been happening for thousands of years, from the Silken Road to the Belton Road. There has always been contact between the two places. On the 1st of October 1949, the leader of the Communist Party Mao Zedong announced the establishment of the People's Republic of China after his party defeated the Nationalist Party in a civil war. Communist China was new to the world and after both the Second World War and the Civil War, Beijing's international relations needed to be reset. The problem was some countries were suspicious of the new China, while many refused to recognize the new government. The communist domination of the Far East must not be permitted. For Chairman Mao, China was a springboard, an inspiration for other developing nations. In the 1950s, his foreign policy was geared towards supporting other radical and revolutionary movements, which caused a rift as other countries opposed these forces. During the first seven years of the PRC's life, no Arab country had relations with Mao's government and official Chinese representation in Middle Eastern capitals was mostly staffed by members of the previous regime, which the communists toppled. What shifted attitudes towards Beijing was the so-called Arab Cold War, where, following the end of European empires in the Middle East, states across the region battled for dominance and supremacy. The Mal Abdel Nasser met with Premier Zhao Enlai at an Asia-Africa summit in 1956. This was followed a few months later with the two countries establishing relations and despite US pressure on Cairo to pull back, Enlai was invited on a state visit to Cairo. Others followed suit with Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Morocco and Algeria building bridges with Beijing. The closeness of the PRC to Egypt, Algeria and others put Beijing in the radical anti-monarchist camp in the Arab Cold War, which put it in opposition to Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. They also inhabited the anti-Western camp, with support for groups like Algerian National Front or FLN during their revolutionary war against being a French colony. The FLN declared a provisional government in December 1958, and China was the first non-Arab government to recognize it. The Palestinian Liberation Organization had a very close relationship with Beijing. PLO fighters would head to China for training and weapons, and military manuals from the CCP were used by PLO commanders in the Middle East. Indeed, in the 1970s, 
leader of the PLO, Yasser Arafat, said China was the biggest influence in supporting our revolution and strengthening its perseverance. So what you see is the Chinese you know, competing with the Soviet Union for you know, influence as the premier communist power. Of course, China is at that point still the junior partner. And so it's at a disadvantage because it's, although it's closer to you know, Arab nationalist and socialist regimes like Gamal Nasser in Egypt and the Ba'athist regimes in Iraq and Syria, it has a disadvantage in the sense that it has come to uh, the region later than Moscow. And as a result, it is looking for additional uh, points of influence and points of contact. However, China's overall influence over the Middle East was limited. Its association with regimes like Nasser in Egypt and the Dofar Liberation Front in Oman meant the Gulf monarchies and their allies shunned Chinese influence. Saudi Arabia chose to have a closer relationship with Beijing's rival Taiwan, which in the 1960s enjoyed greater global influence than China did, as it had the seat on the United Nations Security Council. Mainland China's control over Taiwan, which to this day Beijing says belongs to China, has always been loose and tenuous at best. Between 1895 and 1945, Taiwan was under Japanese occupation. After the Second World War, Taiwan rejoined China under the nationalist, anti-communist Kuomintang rule. China went on to become a founding member of the United Nations, but after 1949 communist takeover, the nationalist government retreated to Taiwan, and so the international community recognised Taiwan as representing the legitimate government of China. Mainland China under the CCP would not be admitted to the UN until 1971, when it also became the sole recognised legitimate government of China. Indeed, Saudi Arabia was the only Arab country to vote against China being granted admission to the United Nations. Taiwan was deeply involved in the region through its connections to Saudi Arabia, which lasted until 1990. In Yemen, at the behest of Riyadh, the Taiwanese military was operating the air defences of the Republican North Yemen and flying combat missions against the communist pro-Soviet and pro-China South Yemen. The American people are a great people. The Chinese people are a great people. Through the common efforts of China and the United States, the gate to friendly contacts has finally been opened. Years of isolation, ideology and cultural revolution took its toll on China and thinking began to change. Beijing decided to move away from ideology and instead focus on economic development and expanding relations with all nations. Symbolically, US President Richard Nixon's visit to China in 1972 was considered a watershed moment representing China's reintegration back into the world. This transition was made easier with the death of Chairman Mao in 1976 and the rise of Deng Xiaoping. Additionally, Beijing was added to the UN Security Council which helped expand China's global influence. Relations in the Middle East began to shift too. You also see the, a realization amongst some in, in Beijing that having supported some of these nationalist movements, this becomes awkward, especially because trying to build ties, diplomatic relations with countries in the region. So for example, Iran, it, it, it builds, it develops relations in 1971, the same with Turkey in that, in that, in that period. So you're seeing a shift away from support from the, for these insurgent groups and more towards you know, established state-to-state -state relations. The situation becomes much more complicated within the region of China. Um, and I think the PLO is a classic example of this. Um, you know, for, the, for, for China's relations with the Palestinians, it's fairly clear cut. You know, they're, 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 their rival is, is Israel, who is also seen as uh, a stooge, an American stooge by the Chinese. However, the PLO creates problems within the places it's based. So in Jordan in 1970, when it's evicted, and then later in Lebanon, uh, where it's seen as contributing to the civil war there, there is a real sense that the Palestinians have become a, prob a problem within the Arab world. And there is a growing uh, a sense that the Arab unity is not really evident anymore. And so that makes, that makes it much harder for the Chinese, because how do you um, take a steer from the Arab world if there is no unity. Indeed, 
The issue of Israel is where we see a shift in China's thinking in the Middle East. Officially, Beijing is opposed to Tel Aviv, but unofficially, it welcomed Egypt's normalization with it in 1979. The signing of the peace treaty took Cairo out of the Soviet orbit, which China regarded as its rival, but also made it acceptable for Beijing to deal with Tel Aviv. Throughout the 1980s, Israel helped supply China with Soviet weapons and eventually the two normalized relations in 1992. Beijing also began to seek closer ties with Saudi Arabia. In 1985, Saudi King Fahad opened a secret channel to the CCP to discuss arms sales. Riyadh was concerned by developments in Iran. With the 1979 revolution and Tehran's war with Iraq, Fahad wanted specialist medium-range ballistic missiles to defend the kingdom, but Western governments refused to sell them to him. He authorised Prince Bandar bin Sultan Al Saud to meet with the Chinese in Pakistan and by 1986 an agreement was reached. Under the codename East Wind, 50 CCS-2 missiles were transferred to Saudi Arabia and stored in underground facilities. Chinese military officials also trained Saudi forces in their usage. The Central Intelligence Agency discovered the existence of the deal and the missiles two years later. Washington reacted angrily and President Ronald Reagan demanded the weapons be removed, but King Fahad refused to comply. The story leaked to the Washington Post newspaper and this caused panic in Riyadh as there were fears Israel would seek to take out the missiles. King Fahad pleaded with Reagan's National Security Advisor Colin Powell to pressure Tel Aviv into not attacking. An attack on the missile facilities would have killed Chinese military personnel, sparking a huge international crisis. After much pushing from the United States, Israel abandoned plans to bomb Saudi Arabia. While the deal was not the most significant arms deal for Saudi Arabia, it did lead to the normalization of relations with China. On the 2nd of August 1990, Iraqi forces under the command of President Saddam Hussein crossed the border into Kuwait and within a few short hours held control of the entire country. A dispute over border demarcation lines, slant oil drilling and war debt owed by Baghdad to Kuwait City had boiled over into conflict. The Iraqi invasion and occupation of the Gulf state shocked the international community and on the 17th of January 1991, a global coalition led by the United States attacked Iraq and the first Gulf War commenced. By the 28th of February, Iraqi forces had been forced from Kuwait and decisively crushed. The ease and speed at which Washington defeated Baghdad came as a surprise to many. It was believed by many at the time that Iraq had one of the world's largest and best equipped armies. No country looked at Baghdad's defeat with greater alarm than China. As David Concullen outlines in his book The Dragon and the Snake, Beijing regarded Iraq as having one of the best militaries in Asia and a technologically more sophisticated one than their own. Chinese military personnel who visited the battlefront during the eight-year war between Iran and Iraq in the 1980s well understood Baghdad's capability and so the decisiveness at which the United States beat them triggered sweeping military reforms in China with the hope Beijing would not be the next Baghdad. But China's role in regional conflicts of the 1980s and 1990s went beyond observational. China was provide a key supplier to both Iraq and Iran during the 1980s, during the war between those, those two 1980s. If you look at the figures, China's sales of, or as insofar as they are publicly available, um, China's sales of weaponry, arms equipment, and arms technology, uh, you know, during the 1980s was the highest it's ever been. It was never as high before or after. And the bulk of that was as a result of the Iran-Iraq war. What you tend to see is the Chinese take, try to take advantage of their sort of outsider status. They often emphasize that, you know, during the course of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, when they're sort of asked or the, when they when they try to explain the causes of the war, they try they accuse the great powers, the superpowers of meddling in the region. And so it's it's nothing to do with these these regional brothers. It's to do with outsiders interfering. Prior to the 1990s, Beijing had sought to cultivate its own energy sources. However, as the Asian country's desire for economic expansion grew, so did its thirst for Middle Eastern oil and gas. But to only reduce China's interest in the Middle East to energy understates the complexity of its relations in the region. 
Perhaps nothing underlines the complexity of Beijing's approach to the Middle East quite like the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq. While not supporting the war, China did expect a US military victory and eyed up opportunities in the new Iraq. The Chinese have often been very critical of, of outsiders and especially the Americans and it's, it's in their diplomatic it's in their political interest to do so. They've also benefited from, from the American presence in the region. So if you think in the course of the 1990s, this is the high point of American power in the region. It's the unipolar moment, it's the end of the Cold War. There is no challenger to the United States. So it's it's not surprising that you're not going to see the, Ch the Chinese you know, stepping up and making, and making their views known. Certainly they make the criticisms on the side, but they don't take an active role in trying to, uh, you know, make it difficult for the Americans. And it's the same thing in 2003. If you go back to that period, the, Amer the Chinese were very unhappy with the way things were going. But they, but unlike the French and the Russians, who were prepared to put you know, diplomatic you know, relations on the line in the, in the Security Council, the Chinese didn't push for that. So it was almost taken as a given that that war would happen. Now, um, for the Chinese, the real interest in the region is order and stability so you know yet they're worried about sort of the chaos that is generated by war after the after the the, the, the breaking of the iraqi regime they were interested in seeing stability return as quickly as possible and so in that and in that respect they ben they benefited greatly from the american occupation because under the so-called american security umbrella you know chinese firms went into iraq post 2003 and you know won a whole load of contracts in terms of you know, rebuilding or re-establishing or developing you know, energy inst installations. Um, and they, they did very well out of that. So much so that some people felt that the Chinese actually, quote, won the 2003 war. Uh, it got to, I mean, and it was also expressed uh, towards the end of Obama's administration uh, when Obama himself you know, criticized and complained about the Chinese, quote, free riding, you know, on the American occupation. Indeed. A report by the Green Finance and Development Center at Shanghai's Fudan University showed in 2021 Iraq was one of the top targets for Chinese economic development. They included billions of dollars in investment in oil refineries and construction. <laughs> The 2011 Arab Spring uprisings which swept across the Middle East and North Africa unsettled many in the region's ageing authoritarian structures. The threat of revolt was coupled with an uneasiness about what role the United States planned to play. There was a sense the Americans were pulling back from the Middle East. From Cairo to Riyadh, a panic set in. These regimes, who had become accustomed to US support, now worried the US was turning its back on them. The fall of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, the refusal by Washington to launch strikes against the regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria for his use of chemical attacks on civilians in East Ghouta in 2013, and the Iran nuclear deal sent a signal that a new regional order was emerging. Chinese President Xi Jinping emphasized unshakable trust between the Chinese and the Arab peoples. As While still wanting close ties with Washington, Arab regimes also began looking elsewhere for support, including to Russia and China. Beijing's attitude towards the uprisings shifted over time. When protests erupted in Libya, China voted in favour of sanctioning the Gaddafi regime and abstained from voting against the implementation of a no-fly zone over the North African country. However, this all changed once NATO intervened militarily against the Gaddafi regime. The collapse of the Libyan dictatorship made China more critical of both the protests and Western motives. Beijing started using its diplomatic power to obstruct international action on Syria. However, as things stand, China plays little role in Syria, despite Damascus constantly making overtures in the media signaling their openness to Chinese investment. Beijing has established what it calls comprehensive security partnerships with Iran, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Algeria, meaning these are the countries it has the deepest relationship with. For China, Professor of Middle East Studies Ding Gang Sung says the appeal is promoting stability through economic development rather than exporting democracy and changing governing behavior. The idea of economic development is connected to China's global economic vision known today as the Belt and Roads Initiative or BRI. Launched in 2013 and initially called the One Belt Road Project, 
The BRI was created to resolve China's economic growth problem, which due to oversaturation in local markets, China could no longer expand its economy domestically and so needed to look abroad to make money. Although originally conceived as being an initiative to expand ties to Central Asia, the project no longer has a geographical boundary and most analysts struggle to describe what BRI is. It is thought of as a vague economic program China adopted. Middle Eastern states have eagerly tried to link their economic projects with BRI, which in of itself is a cause of tension. For example, Iran was one of the earliest supporters of BRI. It sought to use the initiative to develop its own ports. Kazakhstan jumped upon the idea and made Iran a critical component of its foreign policy. In 2014, the Kazakh government inaugurated a railway linking it to Turkmenistan and Iran. The hope is that Chinese goods could flow on Kazakhstan's railways through Central Asia and be loaded onto ships in Iranian waters. But Tehran's development of a deep water port in Chaharabah to rival Dubai not only causes tension with the UAE, but also Pakistan as, so far, Beijing has chosen to invest in a Pakistani port instead. India and Japan, both rivals to China, have either shown an interest in or invested in Iranian ports too. Aside from regional tensions, China has scaled back the BRI funding as many projects have proven unsuccessful. There is growing recognition in Beijing that getting involved with the Middle East means developing policies to mediate disputes between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Historically, China has criticized the United States for interfering in the Middle East, while it had no real policy on regional rivalries. Now it finds itself caught up in the tension. Many Arab states have taunted their growing relationship with Beijing. The United Arab Emirates, despite American concerns, signed deals with Chinese firm Huawei to develop the Emirates 5G network. The two countries also cooperated heavily during the coronavirus pandemic with Chinese vaccine trials taking place in the Gulf state. Many critics of Beijing would caution against seeing China's growing influence as altruistic or purely about economic development. In 2012, the new headquarters of the African Union was opened in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa, which was paid for and built by China. The new AU headquarters was celebrated as being a great triumph bringing together China and Africa. However, in 2018, a French newspaper published a report saying that in 2017, AU officials had discovered that computers in the building had been secretly transferring data to servers in China every night for five years. The Algerian security services were brought in to sweep the building and they uncovered microphones built into the walls and desks. Others argue that Chinese economic assistance to poorer nations leads to a debt trap, where the economically less developed country finds itself unable to pay off the amount borrowed, leaving them vulnerable to exploitation by Beijing. China is one of the world's largest creditors and in the last 10 years has loaned more than $170 billion to low and middle income countries. Research by the William & Mary University in the US shows that the $170 billion figure is likely to be an underestimate as half of Chinese lending is kept off the books. Countries like Djibouti, Laos, Zambia and Kazakhstan are estimated to owe up to 20% of their annual GDP in debt to China, according to the research. Western governments accuse China of using the debt as leverage to get political favours or acquire land in these countries. In the case of Djibouti, China opened up a military base. So with the Arab world warming to Beijing, what will the cost of the bourgeoning relationship be? Once again, once again, once again, nobody can be more concerned about the status of Muslims anywhere in the world than Saudi Arabia and these countries out here. Uh, what we have said in that letter is that we support the developmental policies of China that have lifted people out of poverty. In the far north of China lies a region Beijing calls Xinjiang, or the New Frontier. Populated largely by 12 million ethnic Turkic Muslims, the Uyghurs, the Chinese state has been accused by international human rights organizations of committing crimes against humanity against them. Since the 18th century when Altashaha, or the Six Cities, as it was known then, was incorporated into China, most rulers tended to take a hands-off approach towards the region and allow for semi-autonomy. 
Uyghurs were often exempted from reforms happening elsewhere in China. Things began to change in 1949. After the communists took over China, Uyghur culture found itself under harsher oppression. Although they were still exempt from certain communist policies, including the notorious one child per family law. By the 1980s, as China began to open itself up, Uyghurs increasingly found that they had more freedom to explore their culture and religion. The period saw a boom in Uyghur culture in what some describe as the Golden Age. However, after 9-11, when America launched its war on terror, governments across the world grew increasingly suspicious of their Muslim populations. Chinese anxieties about cultural differences of the Uyghurs led to increasing concerns about possible separatism. Policies to try and assimilate the Xinjiang region and the Uyghurs were rolled out. The CCP then enacted a policy to increase the Han population, China's dominant ethnic group, in the Xinjiang region. The Hanunization of Xinjiang increased tensions and by 2008 and 2009 protests began. In 2009, a riot broke out in a factory in Guangdong after a rumour spread among the Han workforce that six Uyghur men raped two Han women. The rumours turned out to be false and the Chinese authorities never found any evidence of any such incident but during the course of the riot, two Uyghur men were killed. The incident sparked wider protests across Xinjiang, some of which ended violently. Uyghur activists accused the Chinese state of using force against peaceful protesters. In 2012, Xi Jinping came to power. He regarded the Uyghurs as a problem for the Chinese state. A key problem for Xi is his economic vision, known as Belt and Roads Initiative, relies on connecting China to its neighbours in Central Asia, which means cutting through Xinjiang. The fear that the Uyghurs might disrupt the vision added an incentive to enact harsh measures against them. Surveillance of Uyghurs grew exponentially. Signs of separatism or extremism were dealt with aggressively. For Beijing, extremism not only included attending mosque, praying or reading the Quran, it also included not speaking Mandarin, watching Turkish soap operas and not eating pork or drinking alcohol and other social activities. From 2017 onwards, Uyghurs were increasingly being rounded up and sent off to camps, which were later named Vocational Education and Training Centers, but in reality they were internment camps. According to the Chinese government, over 1 million Uyghurs are being held in these camps. While China claims these camps are for educational purposes only, teaching Uyghurs how to be more Chinese, numerous reports of widespread violence, rape, deaths and forced labor led many to refer to them as concentration camps. While both men and women are targets of China's crackdown, with many women being held in prisons and detention camps, there are some gender differences in the way Beijing targets the Uyghurs. Many men are depicted as dangerous and criminals in Chinese media, while Uyghur women are portrayed as beauty queens and often picked as models for their European features. The media portrayal is designed to entice Han men to move to the region and seek Uyghur brides. The Chinese state has taken a number of steps to encourage intermarriage between Uyghur women and Han men, including forcing young women to attend social gatherings, dances and other events to meet men. The purpose of this policy is to breed the Uyghurs out of existence. All of these attempts by the Xi government have led to many to label what is happening to the Uyghurs a genocide. The violence that's been inflicted by the Chinese state has been met with apathy and silence across the Middle East and North Africa. However, since 2017, Evidence has started to emerge that Arab states are doing more than being silent. In June and July of that year, up to 30 Uyghur students and residents were rounded up in Egypt and detained. It is believed they would be deported to China. Other cases started to appear too. In 2020, two Uyghur men were arrested in Saudi Arabia and both are still facing possible deportation to China. One man, Ayman Dola Walili, arrived in Saudi Arabia to visit Mecca and perform Umrah or lesser pilgrimage. He is still in detention, but moves to send him back to China are ongoing. Cases of Uyghurs, who have broken no laws in their host countries, being detained and deported back to China, have been steadily increasing. In 2019, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is reported to have said, China has a right to fight terrorism, seemingly giving his approval to the crackdown of the Uyghurs. One country at the heart of all of this is the United Arab Emirates. The Associated Press reported in August 2021 that China might have secret prisons in Dubai and dissidents, including Uyghurs, are being held there. One Uyghur NGO told us that Dubai is the capital of Chinese spying activity outside China. Whenever the Chinese want to lure a Uyghur who lives in the West or anywhere outside China back to the People's Republic, 
They will often contact them from Dubai and encourage them to visit the Emirates. Dubai has become synonymous with being spied on or rented back to China for many weeks. Uh, my husband, his name is Ahmed Jan Talib. Ahmed Talib, uh, he's, uh, he was working in Dubai before the marriage. Businessman Ahmed Talib moved to the UAE to seek new opportunities, to get away from China's repression of the Uyghurs and to live more freely in 2012. His wife, Amanisa Talib, joined him shortly after. The Talibs thought they would be safe in the Middle East and be able to raise a family in accordance with their Islamic beliefs. In 2017, Amanisa's mother, a teacher, and her brother were detained by the Chinese authorities and sent off to vocational education and training centers popularly known in the outside world as the re-education camps. Amanisa doesn't know why her family members were targeted in this way, as the reasons for their arrest have never been made known. From late 2017, the Chinese authorities began contacting Ahmed Talib and asking him questions about his residence in the UAE, his work status and other activities. Not long after, Ahmed's own family in China started asking him questions and sending him requests for information. By 2018, there was growing pressure on him to do whatever the Chinese authorities were requesting of him. A brother of his called and asked him to send proof that he had no criminal record in Dubai. Ahmed had been in the UAE for six years and had never been in trouble with the law. He couldn't understand why Beijing was insisting on all this information, despite pleas from his wife, who was heavily pregnant with the couple's second child, to ignore the request, Ahmed went to the Dubai police station to register and send documents confirming he had no criminal record. He was worried that something bad would happen to his parents and family back home if he did nothing. It was the start of an 18-day ordeal. And he went to the police station. I asked him, wherever you go, please send me your location. I have to know because I don't have anyone except him in the UAE. So, I was worried about him all day and he was connecting me, with me like uh, till uh, night 11, 11 uh, p.m. He was connecting with me. Uh, there they asked him to give his uh, fingerprint. So they just keep him detained in that police station. After 11 p.m. Amanisa says she stopped hearing from Ahmed and given he was only meant to go to the police station for a few hours to sort out some documents, her concerns grew. The next morning she took her five-year-old son and headed for the police station. Initially the officers at the station would not answer her questions about her husband's whereabouts. Then her son, who was playing around the station, ran past the station's main gate and towards the cells. Amanisa went after him, with the prison guards looking on, as they assumed she was just going to collect her son. It was then that Amanisa came face to face with her husband as he was sitting in a cell. I asked the gatekeeper why he's here and he, he said, I don't know, you have to go to the second uh, floor, ask the office. So I went to there and I asked from him, he said, uh, we are waiting, the information system is not working, so we, we have to wait for another 24 hours, don't worry, after we receive a message, then we will uh, release him. Amanisa went back to her husband and asked what had happened the night before. He said we were uh, talking very friendly till 11 p.m. at night. They were seeing um, the computer and it uh, seems like waiting information. and. Uh, we were having a tea together with the police and uh, talking friendly like then they said oh, sorry uh, we have to keep you detained and uh, we have we didn't receive any message till now ahmed's phone had run out of power so he could not inform amanisa about the prolonged wait at that stage ahmed had not been told what information the police were waiting for and he tried to reassure his wife Unfortunately, uh, after two days, he called me again and uh, his voice is changed, like, just like crying. I have never listened his voice like that uh, in my life. He said they did a blood test and uh, DNA test, urine test to like send him to China. They want to deport him back and he said, I don't want to go back there and I'm not doing anything here why they do like this to me all night I 
like I don't know what to do he said like this and he said uh, please bring my passport and uh, some of my clothes here and maybe we this is the last chance to meet you and meet my son he said like this he said we, we I have to go to court now he said like so we will meet in the Dubai court so I went to the Dubai court. I was crying there, uh, sitting there. And I don't know what to do and what happened like this very suddenly in my life. What can I do if my, they deport my husband? Ahmed feared that as soon as the court hearing was over, he would be deported. But after a grueling session, the court said the Chinese had not sent the UAE any proof of criminal wrongdoing, and so his imminent deportation was out of the question. The court decided to keep Ahmed detained for 15 days until Beijing could send the relevant information. He was transferred to another police station and later that day the police called Amanisa requesting Ahmed's passport. Crucially, they promised they would release him if she complied. She initially refused and the officer on the phone handed the phone to Ahmed who pleaded with her to bring the passport otherwise they would become angry. Amanisa relented and after spending some time at the police station, she asked if they would release her husband. When they said no, she asked for the passport to be returned. Again, they refused. Shamelessly, they didn't keep their words and they say, maybe you can come after two days to give him uh, like the clothes or the shampoo like this. A week passed as Amanisa was preparing for Ahmed's stuff. She received a phone call from another police station in Abu Dhabi. They told her Ahmed had been moved to a station there and asked for proof of their marriage. When Amanisa asked the police officer why her husband had been moved, the officer said he didn't know. Abu Dhabi is two hours away from Dubai and the heavily pregnant Amanisa worried about the added burden the journey would place on her. She called the Dubai court to find out why Ahmed had been transferred but was told they had no idea why he was in Abu Dhabi and told her they would release him. They further assured her they would send the release orders to Abu Dhabi and then Ahmed would be freed. Amanisa was urged to stay away from Abu Dhabi, but after she insisted on going, the court official said they would give the paperwork to her despite the fact this was not normal procedure. The Dubai police later said that Interpol now had her husband. Again, I went to the, the, office, uh, the Interpol office again and I I explained everything to them and what will be happen if they deport my husband is like you are a Muslim country and uh, if you save one people's life it amount to save a whole people's life they were just laughing and uh, like they said only Allah can help you this time we cannot help and uh, if you come again we will uh, take you, we will uh, send you together to you, with your husband. They threatened me like this and uh, in in the end they called the gatekeeper and late and if you see this woman don't allow her to come again inside. They did not release her husband despite Amanisa giving them the court papers. Talking to her husband on the phone afterwards she urged him not to sign any documents and he told her about the daily intimidation of the guards who were constantly telling him that today they were going to deport him. Ahmed told Amanisa to leave the UAE and to head to Turkey as things were getting really bad. He told her when she gives birth if she has a girl to call her Amina and if it's a boy call him Abdullah. Amanisa never heard from him again. On the 29th of February, Amanisa went back to the police station in Abu Dhabi, but they told her they no longer had Ahmed. She went back to Dubai and asked the police there what had happened. They told her to go home and they would call her. He called me after 10 minutes. He said, they deported your husband just one day before. They said like this to me. I didn't believe at that time, you know. How they can deport one person so quickly? Amanisa left the UAE for Turkey and to this day has no idea where her husband is. While China is currently an upper middle income country, it is still not a high income nation like the United States. Beyond economics, the US still dominates the world socially, culturally, politically and militarily. States in the Middle East are not yet ready to be weaned off America and no regional leader sees the United States as eclipsed by China at present. But that does not mean they will not change their minds in the future. 
The more involved China gets in the Middle East, the more the Middle East problems will become China's problems. The trouble for the residents of the MENA region is that China is an authoritarian state with little to no tolerance of civil society, freedom of expression or democracy. While many are critical of the United States, its nominal commitment to human rights, freedom of expression, civil society and democracy does still hold appeal for many Arabs. Even harsh critics of the US in the region still believe the US has good values. A friend from the Gulf who has never said anything positive about US foreign policy told me, Flawed as the United States is, we will miss it when it's gone, as a world dominated by China is going to make our lives harder. The comment stunned me, but it revealed the complex nature of the United States' involvement in the Middle East. The case of the Uyghurs sent a chilling message about Beijing's willingness to pursue brutal policies across the globe. The fact that the Arab world is involved only adds to the anxiety about what a new Beijing-aligned region will look like. While regimes blame protesters for the past decade of instability, many people blame the authoritarian rulers. China's support for the old authoritarian order is many wondering about the future direction of politics in the region.